Hello and welcome to Josie and the Podcast. I'm Josie, and I'm so happy to have you here with me today. This podcast features leaders who share everything from their latest tweet to their leadership philosophy. My goal is to connect tech and leadership with heart, soul, and lots of substance. Before we begin, here is a good old message from our podcast sponsor, Campus Sonar. Every higher ed campus should treat social media as the high-profile, high-potential community communication channel it is. Campus Sonar is on a mission to help higher ed social media managers approach their work strategically and persuade their bosses to recognize the value and impact of their work. Their new book, Fundamentals of Social Media Strategy, a guide for college campuses, offers strategy, research, and best practices for social media managers. CEO and founder Liz Gross, along with a few expert contributors had so much to say they're releasing it in two volumes sign up now to receive volume one when it's released on october 19th at info.campusonar.com backslash social strategy book all right let's get to know today's featured guest Jenny Lee Fowler is the Director of Social Media Strategy at MIT. Jenny is in charge of developing and executing institution-wide social media initiatives and campaigns. She provides social media consultation and direction for more than 200 departments, labs, and centers, and manages the flagship Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn accounts. Jenny also leads the Social Media Work Group, which has 160 members. I've been following Jenny online for some time now, and I was excited to sit down with her to chat behind the purpose behind her posts. And I was so excited, and we got into our conversation so quickly that I completely forgot to plug in my microphone. That is how good of a conversation it was that I was hooked in from the second we pressed play on Zoom. But what you're going to hear is about her social media experiment that brings out a whole lot of bravery and honesty. She also shares why she uses her prime real estate of her Twitter bio and handle and name to clearly state issues that are important to her. She's also going to share with you what she's learned from her quarantine experience from posting every single day. She's especially found energy and commitment to uplifting a community of women. We also get talking about what it's like to manage social media for a brand during a pandemic. She still sticks with the empowerment message from Um, empowering those that she supports throughout MIT to other social media managers across not only higher ed, but beyond. And we also get to talking about how to build relationships with campus senior leaders so they can respond authentically and timely during this pandemic. Now, of course, you can follow both of us on all the socials, which is found in the show notes. Find the podcast on Twitter at Josie AT Podcast. I'm at Josie Alquist. And Jenny is at the Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y Lee, L-I. Everything we talked about from resources, people, and posts is found on my website, josiealquist.com backslash the podcast. Enjoy. So Jenny, welcome to Josie and the podcast. I would love to get to know you a little bit more. And the way that I do this on this show is we look at your bios on Twitter. You share director of social media strategy at MIT, mostly tweets about hashtag HESM, work-life balance, and now working from home with a kid 
because COVID-19 and <laughs> she, her, hers. Mm -hmm. So what can you share a little bit more based on what you've chosen in your bio? You know, I'm a what you see is what you get type of person. And I'm a big believer that your bio should tell others what they can expect and the type of content that you can expect when you follow that person or when you follow me. So that is pretty much it. And so if you're interested in those things, you know, by all means, please stay <laughs> if, if you're not. And, you know, someone recently told me that when you put your preferred pronouns, it's not so much that, you know, I'm stating what my the gender that I relate to, it's more of welcoming others, whatever sort of, you know, whatever gender that they relate with. And I am all about being welcoming. And so that's when I was like, I'm, I'm in, yes. I, you know, I'll add my pronouns to, to show others that I am welcoming to all in that space. Mm, yeah. Documenting that role modeling um, by, putting yourself forward in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to dig all kinds into um, your Twitter feed in a little bit, but, and I haven't looked at your Twitter feed today because I mean, I'm interviewing you. I'm not stalking you. <laughs> <laughs> so another warm up question to get us going is what is one of your most recent posts on Twitter? And you can cheat if you need and tell us why you shared it. Yeah, uh, you know, I think I, I tweeted this morning and I tweeted, MIT social media presence is built on three basic principles. The content is relevant and compelling to our audiences and the audiences we seek to reach. The content is optimized for each individual challenge, uh, sorry, individual channel, and everything is authentic. And, you know, I put myself to a challenge and I said, I'm going to tweet something about social media every day. And yeah, I mean, that's sort of in the, I, I share what I have learned, right? I've shared what I've learned by being in these spaces and being a social media manager for the organizations that I have been a manager for. And this is just one of the things I've learned and I, I'm very transparent in what I do. So I put it out there and I, hopefully people will find it helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, those quick takeaways is one of the ways I found you as I just kept seeing these tweets that had so much goodness packed into them. Oh, thank you. Um, wins, um, and for reflection. So we're going to get into some of those very soon. Great. Well, far be for Twitter and this little pandemic that we've got scrolling way back the clock. As we think about technology bigger than social media, do you remember your first memory? with tech? <laughs> okay, Josie, I love this question okay. and I'm about to nerd out on you like big time. So, uh, so the very, very first computer that I owned was the Texas Instruments TI-99-4A. <laughs> I'm sure everyone has to Google it right now because everyone's like, what is that? So it, it was like before Apple, right? And the reason why we got this computer was that my parents had friends who are some of the most intelligent people we know, and they looked up to them and they, and they bought one for their children. So my parents were like, wow, well, if they got one for their kids, it must be really great for education. So we're going to get one for our kids. So we got this computer, but we would go over to our friend's house and I would see him doing things on his computer. We had the same computer, his computer that I did not understand. Like mm -hmm. he was using the entire keyboard. He was typing, he was putting in symbols. And it's funny because later on in life, it one day it dawned on me that he was coding in, mm. in DOS when we were like six or seven years old on Whoa. this computer, right? So I was playing games on my computer. He was writing code. And the, f the funny thing is, is that he ended up graduating from MIT and I ended up working at MIT. And in a weird way, that computer ended up paying off for my parents. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Oh, that's that's fun. Wow. Yeah, the vast capabilities of technology and what we end up using it for in different ways and <laughs> how your career and college paths uh, yeah. connected. And that's awesome. <laughs> Well, so taking it back to today and um, not only your Twitter bio that we talked about, but your handle. And I've seen more folks over the years starting to do this. No, not just your handle, like your, your Twitter name, right? Mm-hmm. You can mm-hmm. customize both. And yours, along with your name, also includes anti-racist pro mm-hmm. mask. Mm-hmm. using even your title that shows up every single time in a tweet. And when you go to your profile, people are going to see that. Give us just a little background why you chose those phrases, those statements. And so it's already becoming obvious that advocacy is important to you. Mm-hmm. And then maybe what's resulted from putting those two statements on your Twitter? Yeah. I mean, that those characters are prime real estate, right? Like, if you can use them, why not use them? And it was that space in time where the George Floyd murder had just taken place. And mm-hmm. I think everyone was feeling this need for to do something or say something, you know, and organizations were trying to figure out, do we say something? Or if we say something, what do we say? And I just, I think, you know, while we were sort of trying to craft that message, it, it was, I felt a personal need to say something and be very clear on where I landed, you know, with this issue. And I think, you know, that was my subtle way of sort of fulfilling that need. And I think that, again, you know, I'm, I'm a very what you see is what you get type of person. And I, I want people to know this about me. And I, I don't, I don't think it is, I mean, I know you asked, you know, what, what has resulted. I've never gotten any negative feedback or, you know, blowback of any type. If someone came to my profile and saw that and decided not to follow me because of that, I am a hundred percent okay with that. You know, I, I think in this space, I'm trying to you know, it's been, I'm, I'm meeting like-minded people um, that are supportive. And, and if this has helped with that, then that's, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's interesting to also call it like prime real estate too, mm-hmm. to use those really strategically. Well, on your Twitter bio, and then even on Instagram, you talk about like, you know, being a mom on Instagram, mm-hmm. you call it working mama. Mm-hmm. So how is wrestling with working from home and caring for your daughter and running the internet for MIT? <laughs> how is that going? Well, you know, first I will say I do, I have one kid and there are some very, very hard working mamas out there that have multiple children, you know, and they're all trying to juggle their remote schedules and each kid is in a different room with their, I mean, I, you know, kudos to them. I know that there are very, very hard working women that have children that are out there. For me, I, I, I mean, it's day by day. And of course the, just the scheduling and keeping her occupied and constantly engaged with something is, is difficult. But what kind of keeps me up at night is navigating sort of the emotions in this time, because they're so different. Like, you know, one one day there was a time where she was really, really upset and it was something very small, but it was very upsetting, of course, right? It's never that thing, right? It's always, a, but you know, she was just crying and looking at me and saying, you know, I'm, I'm so angry, I'm so angry and I don't know why. And I, t- I totally get it, right? Mm. It's, it's hard to put the right words to those emotions because we're all having a hard time right now. And mm. it's just, I just hope that I'm doing okay, like navigating those emotions and guiding her through them. I don't know. That's, that's what I, is, I find the most challenging, I think, right now. And I know even this week that we are doing this recording, a lot of students are, quote unquote, going back to school in mm-hmm, a variety mm-hmm. of different formats. So I really think that parents and caretakers have had some of the most difficult jobs and experiences during this pandemic. So mm-hmm. sending lots of love out your <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah. No, it, yeah, it's it's a challenge. Yeah. 
Well, another role that you have had um, at the beginning of your career was a news anchor. This was a fun (laughs) discovery to find on your LinkedIn page. Um, I didn't go down the path of seeing if I could find old like reporting (laughs) maybe on YouTube, (laughs) but so interesting. I'm curious how that experience informs your current work. And and again, like kind of like what that path took you then to directing social media. I guess first of all, I should say thank you for not digging too deeply. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, it's all storytelling. You know, it's just a different platform. And writing for TV news really is uh, short form writing where you really are challenged to find the least amount of words as possible and say it as simply as possible to a wide audience, right? So I really think that that's helped me in a lot of ways to create p- content and posts for social media platforms. So mm. it, was, it, it, it's, it was a seamless transition, I feel like. Cool. Yeah, storytelling. And of course, now video, of course, is part of all Mm -hmm. the social platforms. Totally. Another um, type of platform is podcasting. Of course, you're on one right now. Um, (laughs) But the other way that I found you was from another podcast called the Thought Feeder Podcast with Mm -hmm. uh, John Stephen Stansel and Joel Goodman, where you jumped on and you were talking about this quarantine experiment to post on Twitter or social media, maybe in general every day, which I immediately was like, oh my gosh, that I totally did that. But it was years and years ago when I was brand new to Twitter, I was super intimidated. Ah. And I said, I'm going to tweet every day for the month of December just to get used to the platform. And so when you started to talk about it, I sat up right away. And so I'm curious now, because that interview was in the spring of Mm -hmm. 2020, where that experiment has led to, if you're still doing that every day, and, you know, again, what you've learned from it. Yeah, absolutely. So it it was Twitter. I said, I'm going to really try to, you know, do this experiment on Twitter. And it's been amazing. Can I tell you? Like, I think one thing that I've discovered is just the the supportive women in this space that do what I do and that are lifting each other up, I think has been just so rewarding and so amazing. But also it's been great. You know, MIT has such large numbers. You know, I can I can almost I know what's going to resonate with this audience or the MIT audience. And I can almost know if if there's a certain tweet that I put out, it's just going to get like a lot of engagement, you know, and you, you, you tend to take that for granted a little bit. So it's been a great sort of case study, if you will, because a lot of the principles that I have built audiences on, right. I, I kind of put to use on my own channel and it was, it's, it was good to know that it, they still apply, right? They, the basics and the foundation still work. And so it's, it's just been sort of, it, you know, affirming and, and interesting and, and amazing in that I found this wonderful community as well. You know, I think that's sort of been the biggest surprise. Awesome. Well, I know sometimes those just little strategies to get us going and, It definitely seems like you have, you've taken it and run with it. And again, all those tweets are so quickly informative and inspirational. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, something you, you started to mention a little bit on that podcast too, was speaking honestly about your struggles with imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. which I go through pretty much morning, noon, and night. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's, it's always nice though, to talk openly about it, either if it's on the internet or in conversation formally and informally. So you one tweet that caught me that you tweeted out some experiences of overcoming what you called the doubt monster, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. you said could honestly be more toxic than trolls. And I also have my own words for what I call the voices <laughs> in my head. Mm-hmm. So you said, I recognize it for what it is. I do not take any action influenced by my insecurity and I give myself space to breathe and be still. So thinking about overcoming imposter syndrome, and this doubt monster. What has that evolution been like for you? And again, what other advice you might be able to give to listeners? Well, it's it's just interesting because I, I 
I'm in my middle years, which, by, by the way, I'm, I'm trying to reclaim the term middle-aged because why did that become such a negative term to begin with? I feel like everyone goes from being in their 20s to being like old overnight. Like everyone talks about being 20s <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, it's like, oh, I'm old. I can't do this anymore. Oh, I'm old. I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not old. I don't feel old. <laughs> I'm, I'm not 20 anymore, but I'm in the middle and I am okay with that. You know, so I'm trying to reclaim that term. So I'm in my middle year, years and I still very much feel this, right? And you, you talked about this too, like the insecurity pops up and I just, I just feel like what would it be for young women who are in this field, who are working at home, probably living by themselves and, you know, they're in these awkward Zoom meetings where some, sometimes the interchanges can be awkward or weird. And I, the one thing that has always helped me throughout my life is knowing that other people, other women in particular go through this and still go through this. Right. And so a, like, I want to acknowledge that this is something that I deal with regularly and and here's how, (laughs) and it just takes practice, right? Like I am better at it now maybe than I am when I was 25, but it's still very real. And, and when I feel it, it shakes me. It, 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 it takes a lot of effort actually to kind of get out of that whole headspace of me questioning myself, you know? And again, I get better over time, but man, it's like, it is a process, right? It's, it's, the struggle is real. The the struggle is real. And I mean, for both being in leadership, but also being tasked with such public platforms and navigating, like you said, awkward Zoom calls that you can't really, you know, unpack Mm -hmm. other than on your own. Again, appreciate you sharing that. Oh, thank you. So another one that I wanted to highlight about your social media experiment, what you're tweeting out, which also I think took, this one got pretty popular. Yeah. (laughs) This one resonated. Yeah. Yeah. Was social media managers are often told work your magic. And you said, it's not magic. It's marketing, communication strategy, and subject matter knowledge. And this one really struck me specifically with the wordage of magic and trying to, you know, like use language in ways that, you know, like gives obviously marketers freedom, but actually is a potential gap of the actual realization of what it takes to Mm -hmm. do social and any kind of digital communications. And I also had a moment, and this is also what I love social to be able to see and reflect and think on my own practices Mm -hmm. because I have called marketers magicians. Mm -hmm. And I've also said like, I'm a fangirl, I'm an advocate, but language matters, right? Like down even to your Twitter name and, and using certain language or using your pronouns. Anyway, it really gave me a moment of pause to think about knowing how much advocacy social media and social media managers are needing always, but especially right now, Mm -hmm. it struck a chord with me. So I'm just curious a little bit more, like what was coming from that tweet? And I guess if like a leader is listening right now, Mm -hmm. what do you think they would need to hear about what it's really like not to just do magic? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. to to be a skilled communicator. Yeah. First of all, thank thank you. It's always nice to hear that, you know, your the content you're putting out is resonating. But th- you know, that's a funny thing with this is that it it seems like a compliment. You know, I I heard it for the better part of 10 years and it feels like a compliment, but I think over time and as I've matured in my role, I think the thing with it is it doesn't, the people who have, and and this is not all, this is not in every case, but it just feels like they're not wanting to actually acknowledge what it is or understand it. It's, it's, it's almost like they're saying, well, I don't really want to understand it and I don't want to do it. 
And, and I'm just glad that you're doing it for me is what it kind of started feeling like. Mm. And I think that, you know, we should start calling the skills, we should start advancing the vocabulary and giving more validity and credibility to the positions themselves. Like, I just think that we would be doing a disservice for the social media managers that are surely to come after me, right? And fulfill my position in the future. Like, I want them to be in a space where they don't have to prove their value. It just, it's automatic, right? And it just sounds so different. Like, if if I say, you know, Josie, you're amazing, you know, work your magic, you know, and I'll check back with you. That sounds different from, you know, Josie, we value your skills and your expertise in marketing, communication strategy, and subject matter knowledge. And I don't know how we would navigate this time without you. Mm -hmm. It just comes across so differently, you know? And so I'm just trying to help move the conversation forward so that, you know, those coming up after me sort of are in a better place to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there goes that role modeling again, which uh, (laughs) I love. And I'm thinking about it, social media as an industry is still fairly newer, both in obviously the platforms, but in the the amount of positions and the resources available on campuses or even just the industry period. So having the, again, that eye of reaching back to help those that are coming after you, not just to serve yourself and your needs is awesome. (laughs) Thank you. So as we think about all of the complications and roller coasters of the pandemic period, but especially managing social media right now, it's one thing to be putting out quote unquote normal content, even as a person. But when you think about then managing it for a brand and especially for a campus like MIT, (laughs) can you give us just a little insight into what it's really like to be a social media manager? And you could compare that before and after if you would like, (laughs) but I think it would definitely be helpful to know what's really going on right now for the front lines of the (sighs) internet. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think if you are in social media or even just in co- communications in higher ed, I think that you always know that there's going to be that at least, no, you always know that there's going to be like one crisis that you will have to navigate. And prior to the pandemic, you know, the the big things that you tried to prepare for was heaven forbid there, there would be a shooter on campus, right? That's like the, the ultimate crisis you don't want to happen, but seemed very possible to happen. And there's also like a, a PR sort of scramble that you have to, you, that you have to navigate, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, you're always trying to prepare for the one, right? You know, (laughs) But 2020 has been a year of crisis communications. Mm -hmm. It's just been a constant fire drill. Mm -hmm. And I have never experienced anything like it. And and it's just, it's not, it's, it's not like a matter of when will we see the end of the tunnel on this certain crisis it's it's like when will the next one hit it, yeah so it's been a trip for sure mm, yeah well preparing for the one of potential scenarios versus just back to back to back constant back, mm-hmm. that can definitely um wear on a person Well, you are also providing support, not just to the main university channels, but there's over 200 departments and a group with over 160 members Mm -hmm. where you're providing social support. And that I know is a whole lot of hurting of people (laughs) and ideas, but I am finding that these are important groups to organize on campuses 
whether they're called work groups or task force, anyone doing social on a campus, trying to get folks on the same page and providing them education and support. So how would you kind of describe your process if someone listening is realizing either they need to create one of these or they need to improve the way that they are they're putting all those different people across campus together to give them support? Yeah, absolutely. So our our group that you're referring to is is the social media working group. That's what we call it. And it's it's fun. my big philosophy is that I empower other um communicators, social media managers to succeed, right? I th- I think you'll hear a lot of social media managers talking about policing different accounts. Like there, there's always you know, you hear people reference a rogue account that they're trying to shut down. But for me, I think, uh, I think that's exhausting. (laughs) And I, I, yeah, and I always want to make people know that I am available to them if they want to talk strategy or best practices or just to get content ideas. Like I tell everyone, and and we do have lots of communication teams of one on our campus. And I tell them that think of me as your social media team mate or colleague. Mm. And so I'm always available if you just kind of want to throw some ideas at me. But yeah, I always say that I'm a colleague. And so my, you know, my goal is to, no matter which account that you come across, on in throughout the MIT community, whether it's like the Office of Sustainability or if it's athletics or if it's medical, I want the experience to be consistent across the board, right? And so over time, you know, we meet and I, you know, we always talk about new trends or new, you know, or best practices or just we share ideas and I I have always made myself available to anyone who wants to, you know, who has questions or just wants to talk about ideas. And over time, I think people have realized, you know, oh, Jenny can help you with that. Or, you know, Jen, you should, you should ask Jenny, she'll let you into this group and it's just become its own thing. Right. And so, which is, which is really encouraging because then more people are hearing sort of the same message and, and and it makes that you know it and it becomes more consistent across the board so you know this i find this to be the most fun aspect of my job because we get to talk about you know what works or we get to talk strategy uh, uh, just of on a very basic level like who's the audience and what are you trying to do and we um, talk about content possibilities and I I you know I just I just to me this is like one of the best aspects of my job mm. and so yeah yeah and I think over time like people want to be a part of it so which is encouraging cool. I really love that philosophy that it's about empowerment and it sounds like you make yourself accessible and approachable because there's definitely different approaches and philosophies out there. Like you had mentioned, approaching a problematic pages Mm -hmm. that are gone rogue or again, just kind of more of a a, a more negative view of all the accounts that are happening across Mm -hmm. campuses that that lens can be picked up from folks for sure. So just logistically, it sounds like there's lots of tie-ins of communication probably year round, but do you meet monthly? Is there any kind of hub that you're all staying connected with? What may be some logistics of it? Yeah. So we do meet monthly. And of course now um, the coming academic year, we're going to um, have online meetings. I do have a monthly newsletter that I put out and it's, it's, it's very internal, I would say, you know, we talk a lot of about like internal accounts that I'm loving or, you know, new videos that have been put out by the community that not everyone might have seen. So I really like to amplify the good work that's being done throughout our community. 
and we have a Slack channel. And I know everyone is on Slack now, but in 2017, we had, it was an email, it was an email list. And the email list started to act like a messaging platform, like where people mm. were talking to each other and the, there were threads and sub threads and the email threads just became unruly. <laughs> <laughs> and As so, they do. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, it was just too, too much. And so in 2017, I just, I mean, it's funny. I, I, I guess I made an executive decision to move that the whole entire group into Slack and it's been great. And so, but an unforeseen benefit of that was that that group was so we, we were so coordinated and already using the Slack space really well that when we all moved off campus, it was already a high functioning mm. unit on that space, which served us even better because there was so much that we had to communicate to everybody quickly, especially as everyone was moving off campus. So that ended up being a real benefit for us. But yeah, it's it's always encouraging. Every time I put out a newsletter, I get requests to be added to the group, which to me is, you know, it's sort of a vote of confidence saying this is really good content. I, I want to see it too. And, you know, when I inherited this group, it was started by my predecessor. We had like 89 members, but it's grown now to 170. So mm. I, I think that's a good sign, right? Mm. Well, and it could be another podcast episode of how to run a Slack channel well. <laughs> so, well, I, maybe I'm that's happy another, to share. <laughs> maybe that's I'm, another series of tweets that you need to put out. <laughs> oh, the, actually, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, there and I'm go. happy to talk about it whenever. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's neat too to share about the internal ways that you're educating like through the newsletter. Again, for us though that aren't on that internal newsletter, we get to basically be part of your Twitter newsletter. Exactly. And there was another tweet that I wanted to feature where you say, show the human side of your organization by using the pronouns you, we, us, and everyone in posts occasionally. And I love this practice of humanizing our organizations and our leaders. So you could just tell us a little bit more about why you've seen this practice resonate and especially for higher ed, why that's important. Yeah. I, you know, I just, I think when people talk to you like a human, we, we all respond well to that, you know? And I think that, you know, there are just moments at the end of a day of a day when I'm thinking, oh, okay, it's Friday, especially those first few weeks, you know, we, when we were all sent home and it just was super, super intense. And I just remember telling myself like, okay, Jenny, like stretch, breathe. And then if I have to tell myself that I, I often think that other people like to hear it too. And, you know, we just started putting them in our tweets and it just, it really, it just really resonated, you know? And um, there was another week where you know, I, I list, I list, I have a list of MIT students on Twitter and I'm often listening to what they're saying. And there was one week in particular where a lot of them were mentioning how they missed MIT and how they missed campus, you know, that they were saying, I miss MIT a lot. And instead mm -hmm. of just saying, we, um, we miss our students, I, we put out a tweet that said, we miss you too. And there, yeah, there's just something just very, I don't know. It's like a hug, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, you're not, it's, it's not that you just miss me. It's, you know, you, you, you've been listening, you know, you, you can hear me say, I miss you. And so mm -hmm. that just seemed to resonate. And I just think that, you know, it's a channel, but on the other end of it is an audience who is, you know, I, just human. <laughs> They're mm -hmm. people, right? right. And I, I think sometimes we lose sight of that fact a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Both ways. And some of it's just so 
simple. It, it doesn't need to be this long out strategy. It's just realizing where we all are in that moment. So one, I'm going off script a little bit here, but okay. you were recently a panelist in the higher ed digital community builders, Facebook group. Yes. Where, thank you for inviting yeah. me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which Tyler Thomas facilitated. So we didn't get to interact quite yet in there, but I was listening in. And it was when you were talking about really listening to students, students, what they were tweeting or what they were posting and how they respond. And I remember you shared also about how you've gotten invited into some student digital communities where you listen and where you really get the pulse of where they are. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you'd be willing to share just a little bit about what those spaces are and why they've been important for you and your social strategy. Yeah. I, so, you know, it, in addition to just creating li lists are great, right? In, in addition to tw creating lists on Twitter, the other sp spaces that our students, I mean, I feel like maybe it's different on every campus, but our students really like their messaging Mess messaging spaces and you know they have their own like facebook cohorts like it's they're sort of like these groups right, right. um that aren't necessarily as public and there, there's a discord channel so discord is similar to slack except discord is more it's more aimed at the gaming community that play games online and they might share more and talk to each other in these spaces and there's there's a Discord server for our students. And, you know, a lot of times they'll talk about Minecraft because they created a, a, an entire MIT campus within Minecraft. So there's a lot of that. But when we send out a letter from the president, or if there's, if we hold like a, a webcast of for information on fall plans, you know, that conversation will kind of seep into the discord channel yeah. and they'll kind of talk about it and you know and you get a real sense of if something hit or if it didn't hit right mm -hmm. and i i just you know and this is this is sort of like a one out just communications 101 but you have to go to where your audience is and and sometimes when it when it has to do with students, it's it's hard. It's hard to find those areas <laughs> where, where yeah, where they're congregating or where. But if you if you can, it's it's um, a very powerful tool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I again, I just remember that I was like, oh my gosh, we need to bring this up, and we'll link to the whole panel recording too. Great. But yeah, going to where your community is and really listening, even if it you know isn't going to be all celebration, so you can learn what's mm -hmm. actually like you said, hitting and and not, and that skill of social listening. So that's awesome. One other piece of your position, as if you don't do enough, is you also support <laughs> your senior executives on campus with institutional initiatives within the digital communication context. Can you share just a little bit about what that actually looks like in practice and why it's important for social media managers or digital communicators to have access to senior leaders? Yeah. So I... I don't know if I should say I'm lucky, but our, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very lucky to be at MIT, but um, our president does not feel the need to have his own personal Twitter channel. But, you know, I've said to him, our channel is your channel. And so when there is a time or if something comes up that's appropriate for us to share for, from the president in first person, I always bring it up, right? If there's always a cool image that comes my way, I ask if we can use it. Here's like the text I'm proposing, but I, I do, I, I can directly email his team and, and we can work, work, you know, to get approval or just, we can very quickly. And I think having built those relationships over over the five years that I've been there ha, have been, that's been key because now they know, right? When I'm asking for something, it's it's more on a social media timeline and they, they, they get it, they understand and they get back to me very quickly, 
And I know that this is not the case at every university. And, but I am so thankful, right? I, it's, it makes for a very smooth process with not, not too many people to slow down the process in the middle. Mm -hmm. And especially in social media, when there's, when there is a opportunity to be very like organic and to immediately respond to something, it's, it's really the, the timing, right? The timing is very important. And so, yeah, it's, I, I feel very fortunate, right? And, and it, it helps to have direct access to at least one person on the president's team. Mm. Well, and that's a great note, at least one person within that team, but also that your president doesn't have a Twitter, but the ability to have him be part of the strategy and part of the a storyteller on the feed. Not every single president needs to be on all the platforms. And some of it's just based on their own choice and DNA. But again, having that access is so critical. So, so <laughs> key. Yeah. Yes. What would you want other higher ed leaders and executives to know about social media from how to support a social media professional to even their own accounts? What's a message mm-hmm. you would want to share? I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, it, it, you're trying to change hearts and minds, right? Of And, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do, but but also I know that a lot of organizations pay a lot of money to get focus group information, right? Like they buy into that. Like, you know, they want to get a room full of seven people or, you know, seven people in a room and just ask them all these questions about your content and your messaging. But when your social channels, you have thousands of people doing this for you for free. And there's one person that is listening to all of that, right? And can has, has very clear ideas of what they're wanting or what direction they're wanting or, or what, what they're needing from you. And not only that, what messaging has hit in the past or done well and messaging that hasn't. And I don't know why you wouldn't want to just, you know, just ask that person everything. <laughs> like I would, I want to, I would want to know all that that person knows, right? So I, maybe if like we change our titles instead of like director I of was social just thinking strategy. That. Yeah. Like what if I was like the chief officer of community engagement or what if we had focus group specialists? Because focus group, I think, hits differently to certain leaders than social media. Mm. But what is the diff? I mean, you, you know, a lot of your channels, it's like you have an audience that is just telling you how they feel about your content and messaging. So I don't know, you know? Mm. Yeah. And that you're a researcher. You can take data and, and turn it around quickly hey, to have yes. such a pulse, which again, documenting that value. There is a, there's kind of like a ball and chain that comes with social media that we brought, we, we, we kind of like drag along that I do mm-hmm. wonder if it already lowers the the importance of it based upon just past perceptions and experiences. And yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I just, I just think that maybe there are leaders, I mean, that, you know, social media came uh, to be after they hit a certain level in their career. Now they're, you know, now they're leading these huge organizations, but they just don't, it's just something that they have not incorporated in the past or, understood, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, Mm. 
Well, as we start to turn the corner, this conversation has flown by, (laughs) but it's so fun to be able to kind of unpack kind of your thought process and experience from just simple tweets as well as your experiences. Are there any books, articles, podcasts, anything Mm -hmm. that you'd recommend for folks based on what we've talked about today? Yeah, I, you know, I just recently read Atomic Habits by James Clear Mm -hmm. and he has, he puts out a newsletter, which I just think is, it's so concise and it's really well done. So I would definitely, it's one of my favorite things in my inbox right now. I definitely recommend that. I know Michelle Obama just recently launched a podcast and I don't know about other people, but I can always you know, have more Michelle Obama in my life. So, (laughs) so yeah, so she's, I, you know, she's amazing. And I, and this might be, this might be a little bit old school in thinking, but if I just encourage young women, right. To either watch the documentary or learn more about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because Mm -hmm. this woman has put together such a body of work. I mean, her legacy, I mean, uh, has Im- impacted the lives of all women in America. Like who else can say that, right? Mm. So I just, I just think that learning more about her is just really important. I know it's a little bit fuddy duddy and old school, but I just, you know. But she's still so relevant, though. Uh, like R- she's RBG, a- she's yeah. amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I just, I just think as young women, it's, it's just really important to mm. learn about her body of work, Mm -hmm. I think. Yep. Well, and neat for you to even connecting back to legacy is related to my last couple of questions that I ask all my podcast guests as mm-hmm. we look to leadership and technology, hopefully through the lens of legacy and not just these things that happen out on the internet, that they're all connected back. So if you knew that your next tweet was going to be your last, what would you want it to be about? Oh man, that's like, I mean, I, you know, I, th- I think it, I think when you, uh, when I was uh, filling out that pre-interview form and you asked what, what would your slogan or what would it be? I think I wrote like, wherever you go, whatever you do, when you leave, be someone who is missed. And my mom has always said this to me throughout my life and it's just resonated with me, but it's that idea of like, leave, leave someplace better than when you found it, right? Is kind of the idea of it. And I have always brought that with me wherever I have gone to work, whatever space that I'm in, you know? Mm. And yeah, I think I would, I would want that to be my last tweet Mm. if I'm fortunate enough for it to be my last tweet. (laughs) Awesome. Well, even again, thinking about how we can make those impacts in digital spaces, Twitter is far from perfect, but mm-hmm. whenever I see your tweets, they, they bring a little bit of that goodness. Into Thank you so much. I could <laughs> not get a better compliment. Thank oh. you. <laughs> well, so finally today, again, you, you've got this social media challenge. You are running MIT's accounts and supporting hundreds of other social media (laughs) professionals on your campus. So for now, what do you hope your digital presence is having an impact on? In other words, how would you describe your why for leading online? You know, on my personal Twitter, I'm I'm very aware that there are young women that uh, are following me. And I just want them to know whatever they're going through, I have been through it and are still going through it. And hopefully, you know, we can make it a better experience for when they get to where we are. I don't I don't know if that's I just I I just want to, you know, always make it better, right? I, I'd mm-hmm. like for, for them to be, hopefully, become, have more credibility and value, right? When they get to where I am and start mm-hmm. from a higher 
place, right? Well, throughout our conversation, you've brought up women a number of times, knowing that that is a population that you intend to want to have an uh, impact on and support, especially within social media and other ripple effects. So, absolutely, uh, and, and I and I, I absolutely love that. Thank you. Where can people find you to connect from socials to emails or whatever else you'd like to share with us? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm on, I feel like you could just Google me and you'll find all of them. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, Twitter, I'm on Instagram, although I mostly share, I think about my personal side on Instagram. And if you find that interesting, then please follow me. Um, LinkedIn, <laughs> I think all of my information you'll find on those three platforms for sure. Oh, great. Well, Jenny, thank you so very much for your time today. I know I'm sure you've been on 12 different roller coasters of what's <laughs> happening at your campus and on the internet. So it's such a treat to finally connect and get to know more about you today. It was a delight talking <laughs> to you today, Josie. Thank you so much. Well, quickly after recording, I already reached out to Jenny that we need to get another chat on the books, and this time it's not going to be recorded. We miss you already. You're doing your mother proud, leaving this podcast and the Twitterverse better than when you found us. So what does this look like in practice? There were so many takeaways from this episode, as well as so many tweets that Jenny is putting out every single day as her challenge experiment called her to do. She encourages you to use your voice to loudly proclaim what you believe and what you stand for. She talked about doing your best to navigate these emotions and guiding your loved ones through it the best that you can. And the word authenticity and empowerment came up numerous times throughout our conversation. She also talked about knowing the platform and what's going to work best for each. So she encouraged communicating with the least amount of words possible and saying it as simply as possible to a wide audience, which I think is so interesting as you get to know, again, the culture and the context of each platform and what's going to make an impact. She also talked about not just using the right words, saying the right phrases, getting the least amount of words or the most amount of words, but gosh darn, we are humans on both sides of these social media channels. And we got talking a little bit about what that impact has been for social media managers. So leaving that message very clear. And then as this episode is titled, Leave the Internet Better Than You Found It, she found herself very drawn to the saying, wherever you go, whatever you do, when you leave it, be someone who is missed. And the idea of just leaving something better than when you found it, and especially as we move closer, at least in the United States, to the election and continuing to navigate the struggles of COVID-19 on our campuses and in our families, as you think about logging off every single night, are you leaving a platform better than when you logged on with it? Even a phone call or a Zoom call, are you leaving that just a little bit better than when you found it? And I know this might seem like quite a daunting and sometimes impossible task when you are faced with challenges, but maybe in those harder times, in those difficult times, when it feels like all Twitter is lost, keep that in mind, leaving the internet better than when you found it. So listeners, how are you showing up online? Would you call it authentically, genuinely? When we allow ourselves to be a little bit vulnerable on screen, we open ourselves up to true community. And Jenny got to talk about that. And I hope you've heard me talk about my stories throughout the years and being able to do that as well. If you're unsure where to begin, you can head to my website, josiealquist.com, to learn more about my coaching that guides you through that authentic process to use values, to build a strategy that will work for you and for your community, as well as my consulting services that help your institutions and organizations do that as well. I want to give Jenny a huge thank you for joining me and all of us on the podcast. We learned so much from you about your story strategy with your social presence, both individually and with your work at MIT.
Thank you so much for checking out this episode. I would so darn appreciate it if you did enjoy it to give it a little review on iTunes or any of your favorite podcasting platforms. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episode. And of course, get sharing it with colleagues, friends, family, and all those connections. Join the conversation online by tweeting at me at Josie Alquist or the podcast Twitter at Josie AT Podcast. And y'all know I'm on Instagram too, for sure. Also at Josie Alquist. Remember the show notes and additional resources can be found at JosieAlquist.com backslash the podcast. If you are interested in learning more about my speaking and consulting work on digital engagement and leadership or my forthcoming book, Digital Leadership and Higher Education, check me out again, JosieAlquist.com. Thank you again to our podcast sponsor, Campus Sonar. Learn more about them at CampusSonar.com. Sending digital hugs, loves, and waves to whatever corner of the world you're listening in from. This has been Josie and the podcast.